Like that. UK boxing blogger coming right back at you. Today on the line, I've got the General Secretary for the British Bo Boxing Board of Control, Robert Smith. How are we today, Robert? Very good, thank you. Right, great. Uh, Robert, just for our listeners and some of the casual fans that might be listening today, could you just give us a, a brief de a description of what the British Board of Control does when licensing its fights in the UK? Yeah, well, we regulate the professional side of the sport in Great Britain. Um, we obviously license all the boxers, medical all the boxers, license the managers and promoters, um, and regulate the tournaments along with and uh, working alongside with the promoters. So making sure all the uh, facilities are in place and the medical grounds are in place, supply the referees and, and everything like that. So everything you see when you go to a boxing show has to go through the boxing board. OK, so when um, world title fights come on the shore, um, how, how do you go about appointing referees and stuff? Is that to, Do you work with the WBC, or IBF and so on to, to appoint referees and judges or is that something the sanctioning bodies do themselves? No, 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 in this country for sure. We mustn't forget a sanctioned body only sanctions the championship. So all the other responsibilities regarding that tournament is down to the Home Commission, which obviously would be the British Boxing Board of Control for any fight in this country. But with regard to referees and judges, etc., we would have a list of people licensed who, who, uh, who are licensed by um, commissions we recognise and also have licences with each particular sanctioning body. They would send us a list of who they feel could work on the show for particular fights. You know, if it's, if it's a British boxer, it's, let's say if it's a European title fight, they'll all be uh, neutral officials. So um, we would have overseas referees and judges. But world title fights, etc. here, we'd have a British referee, British judge and two, and two overseas officials. So it does work. It, it does depend on what type of fight it is. But we work very closely with the sanctioning bodies. And we have final say in who is appointed here. Right, so say if one fighter objects, so say like, for instance, say George Groves didn't want the referee um, in the rematch with Carl Froch and he objected, but he would have to go through the British Boxing Board of Control. Yeah, the Boxing Board of Control, uh, along with the sanctioning body, will have discussions, but um, there wasn't just George objecting to that thing. There was many aspects that had to be considered with regard to the contest and the tournament, etc., which was considered which we don't need to go into, etc. But uh, ultimately, the final decision will be down with us in association with the sanctioning body. Right, OK, that clears a few things up. Thanks for that, Robert. But um, also, another issue um, regarding, like, um, when it comes to boxing um, control is hand wraps. Do, have you got a, a lot of information on what it actually is a legal hand wrap or not? Um, you know, from some people say that you can't put any tape on the hands... And some people say that you're allowed. Is it an open-ended rule, or, or is it into a ter is it like the officials' interpretation of it? It depends, really, on where you are. It depends what what country you're in. Some people allow it. Um, some people allow tape on the skin, but as long as you're not building it up, it's only supporting the bones on the back of the hand. Um, with regard to the bandages, it has to be one bandage. You get as much bandage as you want, as much tape as you want, but you can't have it over the. You can't have tape over your knuckles. And the one thing that does surprise me sometimes is when you go into the dressing rooms and you see the amount of bandage and tape the boxers got on, that they actually get a glove on in the first place and make a fist because uh, I'm sure a lot of injuries for hands are because there's too much bandage and tape on, to be honest with you. But no, a lot, every commission has slightly different rules on it, but as long as it's not uh, felt to, in, to enhance the performance of a boxer, then it's okay. Right, OK, thanks for that, Robert. Right, basically, um, what I wanted to talk to you about as well is the health and safety aspect of um, British boxing. You know, I think one of you guys, you, were, you led the way in um, making sure that all the rules and regulations surrounding fighter safety um, are some of the best in the world. Um, is it is, is the reason for you doing that, like having the, the doctors and all the ambulance ready and stuff, was it solely to do with the Michael Watson fight and Chris Eubank, or no. was there a lot of other factors? No, no. Things move on, don't they? I mean, there was medical provisions in place for the Michael Watson fight, but things move on. Things get better, and you learn from things that go on before. So uh, there, was, there was ambulances in place, there was doctors in place, but obviously... Um, you know, boxing is a very dangerous sport and you have to look at the procedures you have in place all the time. And I wasn't working with the board when that fight took place, but I do know that when I come along, um, some of the things have changed since then. We've, as, as life goes on, you get, 
you know, hopefully you improve on everything you do. So uh, to say it was just part of the Watson case is, is not right. But for sure, the Boxing Board of Control work extremely hard to make this sport as safe as it possibly can, knowing the fact that you can never make it 100% safe because it's the nature of the nature of the beast as such. So, um, but we work very, very hard, very, very hard. We put a great deal of time in. There's a huge amount of money spent to uh, make sure that we do things right uh, with regard to uh, studies um, and, and things like that. So uh, we, we take it very, very seriously, like a lot of people, but we spend a lot of time on it. And, uh, you know, we have to appreciate that, uh, that, that we've been in there a long time We've had things go wrong, and that's why you learn. If you can't learn from your mistakes, then you shouldn't be here at all. No, of course not. But so, because what I've heard from some promoters sometimes, uh, especially some UK-based ones, they when when talking about matching their fighters up with some older fighters, they say the reason why they they can't get them over to England is because um, it, the difficulty getting them past a medical. Is that true from the board's standpoint when issuing licenses to fighters does does age make it harder to obtain a license to fight in the uk no there's no there's, there's a, the only age limit we have is a minimum which is 18 um we wouldn't certainly if somebody applied for a license being 16 and has never boxed before i think that would raise a few eyebrows and i think common sense would tell you that possibly you wouldn't get a license i don't know but we have to take every case on its merits and uh if somebody doesn't pass the medical, then he shouldn't box in the first place. So let's take that argument out of the way. I think what you might find is some of the promoters might argue that maybe we're a little bit strict on who we allow to come over here to box some of their boxers. And, if, and you know, we receive applications every day um, for, for tournaments and for boxers coming over here. And we have to consider their record, what they've done before, um, their, uh, their weight when they were the last box. That, um, uh, whether they put on a huge amount, a lot of weight, whether to indicate they may not be fit, we'll look at the reports from their previous fights, and we'll look at who they're boxing. So, you know, you might bring in a foreign boxer to box boxer number uh, boxer A, and you might not think he's suitable, but actually he might be okay to box boxer D because uh, boxer D isn't quite as good, and his record's not so good. So it's a it's a very difficult and complicated process. They sound easy. But you've got to look at the whole aspect of who they're boxing and where they're boxing, how many rounds they're boxing, um, you know, and the type of fight it is. You know, would you allow somebody to do four rounds, but you wouldn't let him do ten rounds? Well, that's possibly so, isn't it? Because you've got to look at the standard of the boxing act. Ah, OK, so, so age plays no part. It's all to do with uh, the medical condition. If everything is to do with the man's ability. Everything is taken on its own, on its own merits. Uh, as I say, we do have an age limit, but the age limit is minimum age limit. Uh, we will look at everybody. We will look at the whole aspect of a license application. If somebody, if somebody hadn't boxed for five or six years and was forty years of age, I wouldn't have thought we'd let him box. So you know, we have to look at everything. If he's an active boxer um, and he was forty years of age and he's uh, boxing a an opponent that he can look after himself against, there's no reason why he can't. And that has happened in the past. Okay, right. Okay, see, so well, the example I was given was a 40-year-old um, former world champion who's been operating at world-class level. Uh, when when we spoke to matchmakers from one of the, the, the famous um, stables in the UK, there's only one or two, so as in, in big time, um, they, they, they stated the reason why they didn't want him fighting one of their prospects was the difficulty it'd be having fight array that I'm talking about um, getting a license which to me he's never been brutally knocked out or anything like that it seems very very strange seeing as the level he's it's not, operating it's not, at it's not strange at all you've got to look at do we know anything about the boxer that other people don't know do we know you know the sort of fights he's had in the past um, you know has he been going on too long do we feel it's not beneficial for him to carry on boxing and boxing over here there's many aspects we have to consider every boxer that comes into this country and is issued a license is licensed by the British Boxing Board of Control. That means license, that means a fee for that comes from every single license holder in the country, of which is two and a half thousand. We're dealing with their I'm sorry, we're, we're dealing with their um, um, uh, funds, etc. And we have to make sure we spend it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if we've got somebody that we're not sure about, then the right thing to do is not let them box. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I, that's you can't it. just say we do this and do that. You've got to look at everything on its own merits. 
Yeah, yeah, of course, totally understand. Yeah, well, thanks for that, clears that up. Um, no problem. Right, um, what obligation does a, a fighter have to attend final press conferences and weigh-ins with their opponent? Because obviously we've got a Chris Eubank Jr., Billy Joe Saunders situation brewing up. Um, Frank's obviously been very vocal. Um, we would all like to see them in the final week, the, the last presser before the fight, the final press conference opportunity for them to come face to face. Um, I don't know whether they contractually have an obligation or, or whatever. That's but but for, with, for the board's um, opinion, should they should they should they be obligated to do that, or have they got any obligations with you to do, go through with these scenarios? Well, I think the situation you're asking me is something I can't really comment on because I could end up with a complaint along the way from one from the promoter against somebody else. So I think it's sensible that I so, I, I keep away from that argument, particular dealing with those particular individuals. However. The situation is quite clear. When you sign a contract for a particular fight, you've obviously got to go attend the weigh-in, and you have to help in any way you possibly can with regard to the publication of that particular talk, that particular fight. Now, it's up to, if anybody wants to put in a complaint, it's up to that individual to prove that, that the other person hasn't done that. And uh, that's a, that, that will, if we have to deal with something like that, we have to deal with it, and we will deal with it. But at the moment, we've got a great fight coming up, I don't understand why we're all worried about what they're going to do next week because, because until next week comes, we don't know what they're going to do. But I do, I do know that I'm looking forward to it, along with every other boxing fan in the country, for that fight to take place, and I'm sure it's going to be a good one. Oh yeah, brilliant. Um, also, while we're on fights, um, so this weekend, um, has it been a very busy week for the pay-per-view card coming up in Liverpool? Um, how, how's all, how's all the situations with all the boxers? Everybody. Um, Everybody on any, every everything's ready to go for the board. board. Well, we're, ne we're nearly there. The week before the sh tournament is uh, extremely busy. Um, this is no different. Um, got a few things that's going on that will be resolved, I'm sure. But nothing. Un there's nothing unusual this week than it was, would be normally any other week. I mean, don't forget, we've not just got Liverpool. We've got something like five or six other shows taking place this weekend as well just as we do uh, for next the week after when we've got the XL, there's five or six shows or even more going on that weekend as well. So it's just not the big shows we're dealing with. Um, you know, most of the, in fact, the hardest work is dealing with the smaller shows, actually, because um, those promoters haven't got the staff to deal with things that the major promoters do. So therefore, they take a bit more, more of our time, which is, which is understandable. Hmm. And we're happy to do that. But... Um, Normal week, you know, I think we've been extremely busy. We're going to have 220 odd shows this year. We had 220 odd shows last year. You know, it is very, very busy, which is good. Of course, yeah, it sounds like you work, You guys work really hard. How much staff have you got to, to do all of this operation? Six and a half, the half being a part time person. Wow, okay. Um, just for some, this, we know, I, to some of my listeners, we've got a lot of people that want to get into the game of boxing. Um, as in on trainer levels, how how do you go about applying for your your, your seconds license, uh, your corner man's license, and um, if you want to be a cuts man, uh, how do you go about it in the official channels? Obviously, you can go getting your experiences up in the gym and stuff like that. H how would you go about it through the British Board of Controls? That's it, quite angle? simple. Uh, you apply to the relevant area council. The, the, the boxing board is split up into seven regions. Um, uh, you apply to your area secretary for an application form. Uh, we'll come to the head office and then we'll send your application form and you apply to the area secretary. Um, if it's a boxer's license, straightforward. You will go through all the medicals. As we'll see, first of all, deem to see if it's suitable for you to have a boxing license, then go through the medicals. If it's trainers, etc., um, they'll apply. They'll go for an interview before the relevant area council. And if, it's, if they're deemed fit to carry on, they're then recommended to go on to a training course, a day and a half training course, uh, which we run eight or nine around the country. And they go to that. And if they pass that, they will get themselves a trainer, sec trainer or seconds license. And uh, fairly straightforward, but uh, obviously can take a little bit of time and quite rightly so. No, no, yeah, because safety and make sure people are professional. Yeah, that's that sounds really good. So, all the listeners out there, you can can you find that information on the on the website? Well, you can certainly contact the office. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Right. Also, I've got one last question before I go today. Is fighters when you give licenses to to fight in on on the in British soil, is out any outside 
um, you know, so when a fighter gets in trouble, maybe domestic violence or they've got some sort of recreational drug use, uh, any of these factors play a part in, in the refusal? Yes, of course. Yeah, of course. If somebody, we would have a, you know, but let's be honest here, we have a number of boxers who have convictions, for sure, we know that. And we want to know about it. If you, you know, if we stopped anybody who had a conviction, we'd lose quite a few boxers. I'm fairly sure. Hmm. Boxing is a way, um, is is a way of uh, of getting away from that sort of life, and we have to understand that. And most people do understand that, but we do want to know. And um, if if somebody has an, if somebody applies for a license and they have con previous convictions, then we will ask for their police record, and we will look at their police record. And, um, you know, a lot of it is when they were younger, but most of it is when they were a lot younger and they've got past that now. And, and boxing is a way of them to improve their life. And we're very happy about that. But yes, for sure. Well, OK, yeah, because I've got a few listeners that have had previous criminal convictions and they wanted to know that they want to start um, getting into boxing so they are safe to turn their life around and apply for licences and it won't be held against them as long as they're obviously going down the right path. Yeah, I mean, you've got to look, as you say, it's, it's, any application is, a, is on its own merits. You can't just have a sweeping statement. It's not going to be a problem because we have to see what the issues are. But for sure, you know, anybody can apply. It will be considered if you have had problems in the past, then, you know, we hope boxing can turn your life around. It has, and I, I would say for 80% of the time, it does turn people's life around. Sometimes it doesn't, but you're always going to have that. But, uh, you know, we take into consideration, as I say, a lot of the time, um, the, the boys or girls have been in trouble when they were very young and they've got over that. So, uh, you know, that's all considered and then we can, we'll decide whether they can go on with the licence. OK, well, thanks. Thanks for today, Robert. We really appreciate that. Um, I know you're very, very busy this week and probably busy till the end of the year now. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the phone and explaining some of the uh, intimate details of the rules that sometimes the fans get um, modelled up with. Um, is it? Thank you very much for that, Robert. No problem. God bless you. Take care.